Hello, I'm Rhonda Whitaker, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. Early summer in Puget Sound means crabbing, and there's nothing quite like a fresh crab on the dinner table after a day on the water. Larry Phillips from our fish program shows you just how simple it is. Today we went out and uh, dropped some pots here in South Puget Sound. Um, we were targeting Dungeness crab. We also caught Red Rock crab. But Red Rock and Dungeness crab are very prevalent throughout Puget Sound. Um, they're a highly sought after um, shellfish species that uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife sells many licenses annually for people that are targeting this species. It's really r quite simple in, in, a, in the approach. Uh, we Today we, we utilize both uh, traps and ring nets. A variety of baits can be used at a variety of depths. Um, we drop them down anywhere from you know, 50 feet to 120 feet today um, using uh, fish carcasses that were caught a while back. Other things that work well are uh, turkey, um, Oh, other types of shellfish, uh, clams and that such work as well. Some people do use cat food um, and some other products, dog food, uh, canned, canned products like that. Um, my experience has been it doesn't work as well, but people use that. I, I don't think that's the way we want to send people is using cat food and dog food. Probably salmon carcasses, uh, other fish, rockfish, bottom fish carcasses. Um, once you've filleted the fish, um, I typically throw them in my freezer, stockpile them throughout the year, and wait for the opening of crab season. You know, like I said, a variety of, of rings and pots um, kind of mix it up a little bit. Uh, if you want to, if you want to put a pot down, the uh, the the benefit of a pot is typically the crab can't get out of that pot. They'll they'll get themselves in it, and uh, they can't get out. So you can set them out for a long period of time, as opposed to a ring a ring trap. Ring trap has essentially no side, so the crabs can just wander inside and, and attract into the bait, and um, and you know you pull it up and basically they're suspend they're they're forced into the bottom through through the, just simply gravity. The benefit to a ring net is that you can fish it every 20 minutes. You can pull it up every 20 minutes or so. Um, it's giving the crabs a chance to get in because they don't have to find that door. Um, traps again, a lot of people fish traps and they'll put them out overnight. Crab fishing is, is fairly tightly regulated now, um, as opposed to you know in the past it it's been a quite a long season. Now we've got certain restrictions that that um, take place in a variety of different fishing areas, uh, marine areas, and uh, it's best to to consult the fishing regulation, the fishing pamphlets for those specific regulations to the area you're going to fish. Once you harvest the crab, certainly you want to keep the crab alive and keep it nice and fresh until you get it to your home or back to camp or wherever it is you're going to cook the crab. Um, one method I like to use, I, I typically get a large pot of water boiling and I'll boil my crabs whole. Um, a ver another popular method of doing it is to clean them before you cook them. Um, once they're cleaned, I typically get them cold fairly quickly and then um, clean them. It's a great family event. There's typically uh, a lot, seven, several generations at one time doing it. I take my grandparents out and, and kids, and and uh, it's just a really good family family fun. The size restriction for Dungeness crab in Puget Sound is 6.25 inches or six and a quarter inches, and the bag limit is five per person per day. And make sure you lo register your crab as you catch them on your catch record card. As you catch crab and before you deploy your pot back into the water, you need to, to register that crab on your catch record card. At the end of the season, the department requires that you, anyone who purchases a fishing license, um, regardless of if you participated in the activity or not in this during that previous season, that you send that catch record card in. Um, and the reason that's so important is so that we can we can make sure that we don't over harvest the stocks out there and we make sure that that resource is available for the future. Now, some other fishing opportunities across Washington in the coming weeks.
In our fourth year of work to recover declining populations of the Upper Columbia River sturgeon, we recently got special help from young students. There's no such thing as introducing kids to science too early. This is the fourth year that we've released um, white sturgeon juveniles into the reservoir. Um, for the past three years, we've had a public um, relations component to it where we have fourth grade students come out and we adopt a sturgeon where we um, scan the pit tag number of a fish before it's released and the kid gets a card with that number and they get to release the fish into the boat that's going to be on the boat will then take the fish out and release it into the reservoir. And at some point they will be able to get back onto the internet and look at uh, up their fish and be able to determine the history of their fish and whether we ever recapture it during our monitoring activities. The status of white sturgeon in Lake Roosevelt is um, that, they, that we have a, lar a fairly large number of adults but few um, wild juveniles. Basically they're not, they're reproducing, they're spawning and we're catching larvae but they aren't making it up to the young of year age or very few of them are. We're looking into the factors as to why that's occurring. In the meantime, as a, as a stopgap measure, we're releasing hatchery-produced sturgeon into the reservoir to preserve the demographics of the population. The long-term goal is to restore natural recruitment and eventually, if we can, get the population to a level where uh, we can have some um, fishing at the very least catch and release and potentially long, long ways down the road, some harvest fisheries. Due to the long lifespan and the, uh, the long length of time that it takes for them to reach maturity, um, that will probably be several decades before we'll have a fishery on Lake Roosevelt. It takes them about 25 years to reach maturity and it varies based on the population and we're not exactly sure for Lake Roosevelt, but the estimates are around 25 to maybe 30 years. The females reproduce uh, rough on a, on a period of every four to five years or so based on our best estimates and these things can live up to a hundred years. Most of the evidence right now indicates that once they reach maturity they will spawn um, most of their life lifespan. If we can uh, narrow down what the problems are for recruitment or, or the, the lack of survival for our um, wild juveniles, if we can figure out those problems and increase those rates along with some of the hatchery supplementation that we've been doing it it's, uh, it's a possibility that the fourth graders that have been helping us the last few years, when they're adults, they may have the opportunity to fish for these things. There's a mixed reaction from kids. Most kids are a little um, uh, apprehensive to touch these things at first. They look kind of prehistoric with their sharp scoots and they're, they're a little bit more rough to the touch than what you'd expect from a trout. But once they touch them and they get to experience these fish, they seem to be very excited and we think we're adding to a generation of, of stewards for the resource. But we also bring in a group of high school students that are in a, in a wildlife resources class at a local high school and their job is, is basically to be mentors for the fourth graders and their role in here is to, to kind of um, show these kids that it's, it's neat to, to be involved with this type of work and that these, these, these fish are uh, interesting. It's not just the adults telling them, but it's older kids that they could look up to that have an influence on some of their um, experiences. Washington ground squirrels and golf courses don't mix, so students at nearby Warden High School, just south of Moses Lake, have been assisting our biologists in moving animals to a more suitable habitat. And they get credit for a hands-on science lesson. The Washington ground squirrel is a species that we're very concerned about. And the reason we're concerned is we've observed a range contraction and we're seeing uh, inactive colonies at areas that have been active in the past. And so that uh, raises some, some alarms and, and so we're interested in taking a proactive approach at, at getting on the ball and uh, trying to learn how to uh, protect this species from a further decline. Here at the golf course we have a very large density of Washington ground squirrels. Uh, the manager of the golf course is concerned about damage issues. They're, they clearly cause some damage on the course. 
And so we see this as a, a, just a mutual relationship where we can come together and work with this golf course manager to help him trap and remove some squirrels and we can move them to areas where we think they would be better off bolster existing populations and, and hopefully just overall do good things for the Washington ground squirrel. We've been working with the uh, Warden School because we feel that it's very important that students be educated, become interested at an early age in wildlife species. Uh, doesn't really matter what species it is, but uh, we have a unique opportunity with Washington ground squirrels and so we uh, felt that it would be really uh, beneficial to get them involved in this. Um, they happen to have Washington ground squirrels at their school site and they've been spending a lot of time uh, observing them there as well and this is a great way to tie those two together and they can see from a management approach uh, what we're doing to try to protect them. I think it gives the students a real life hands-on um, application to some things we talk about in science especially um, and you know give them experience with something out in the real world that they could be doing. They get to see the the interactions of different species together and the reason why they're moving them and and how humans interact with them and the problems that that creates so they get they get to see it and actually help out with it in the little way that they can we accomplished a new home for them to be so they're not a pest to everyone else at the golf course and that way they're safe and away from everyone and they're in their own habitat by themselves now This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can save Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.